Welcome to video six and our look at the use of the Old Testament in Zechariah's song. <clears throat> and today we're going to turn our attention to the use of the Old Testament here um, as found in Isaiah chapter 40. But first we're going to look at the passage from uh, Luke chapter one from Zechariah's song. So I'll pull that up for us to look at. And we see it says this. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. So prior to this, Zechariah has been praising the Lord for various uh, various promises that God is fulfilling in the birth of John and in the birth of Jesus. So we looked at the Davidic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the promises that he made to the prophets. Here now he's turning his, here Zechariah, that is, is turning his attention to what his son, John the Baptist, will do, as well as what Jesus is coming will do. So that's where we're going to turn our attention now, is the use of the Old Testament um, in John's life, as well as in Jesus's life. And so Zechariah here is looking at his son's role in the coming of the Messiah. He states that John the Baptist will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. And in describing John this way, Zechariah is actually quoting from Isaiah chapter 40, specifically verse 3, but we're going to ver read verses 3 through 5. And it says this, A voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So Isaiah in this chapter predicts that the people of Israel will be taken into exile by Babylon as a result of their unfaithfulness to God. So between chapter 39 and chapter 40, there is an exile to Babylon that Isaiah is predicting. Israel's lack of trust in God and a continual turning to idols is what ultimately leads to their demise. Kings are leading them to worship idols and the people willingly follow along. And Isaiah predicts that Babylon would be the instrument that God uses to discipline his people. But the exile would not be the final word for God's people because Isaiah predicts in this passage, in this chapter, that God would again enter to bring his people out of exile. So God had punished his people by sending them into exile, but he would bring them back to the land that he had promised to Abraham. Remember, he promised that Abraham um, and his family would have a land to dwell in. And so even though God sent them out of the land, he promises he will bring them back to that land. And he says that he will send a messenger to prepare the way, and God himself would lead his people out of exile just like he did um, when he led the people out from Egypt and through the wilderness with a pillar of cloud um, by day and a pillar of fire by night. We see that in Numbers 9. So it says here, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. So when we so we see this promise from Isaiah that the, the way of the Lord is being prepared in the wilderness. God himself will lead the people out of exile um, in Babylon. But then when we turn to uh, the return of the people from exile in Ezra 1, we clearly see that God is at work again, but there's no hint that God himself is actually leading the people from Babylon back to Jerusalem. And we further read in Ezra 9 and Nehemiah 9 that the people still viewed themselves um, as in exile, um, or they said that we are slaves to this day because they remained under foreign domination, right? First Babylon, but then eventually Persia, then Greece, then they have a brief period of independence, and then they're ruled by Rome. And so, and who, that's who they're ruled by when Zechariah is making this prophecy. So Zechariah's words predict a fulfillment of Isaiah 40, where God would come and lead his people out of exile. But again, the exile that he leads them out of is not a physical exile because they're in the land. They're in the land of Israel. So he's not leading them out of a physical exile into the land of Israel, but he's leading them out of a spiritual exile where they are enslaved to sin and he will lead them to freedom from sin. John the Baptist is the one who would prepare the way for the end of the exile and the coming of God. But here we actually see a bit of a twist 
the one whom John prepares the way for is Jesus, in fact. Luke identifies Jesus with the coming of God from Isaiah 40. And so Jesus is the Lord, he is God, who hastens the end of the exile of God's people. So Luke reveals yet another way that Jesus' coming is predicted by the Old Testament. John the Baptist is the voice crying in the wilderness. Um, and uh, Luke talks about John's ministry in chapter 3, verse 3. But he proclaims the end of the exile coming through the arrival of the Lord Jesus. Um, so that's a, a way that we see the New Testament authors are identifying Jesus with God himself. We also see later in Isaiah that he describes the return from exile as a, a new creation will happen, that when the people of Israel um, come out of exile, there will be a transformation in the wilderness. Desert will be uh, transformed into a forest, and there will be pools of water and lakes and rivers in the desert and the wilderness. So we see this transformation of nature. But when Jesus comes the first time, that's not what we see, right? We see that he comes, but there isn't this radical transformation of the creation. And that's because um, what Isaiah sees as a one event, the, the return from exile and the creation of nature, the New Testament tell us is actually, tells us is actually two events. Jesus comes to deal with sin and, and lead us out of uh, exile to sin and freedom from the bondage of sin in his first coming. But at his second coming, he deals with the effects of sin all over the world that are found in all the world. So like Israel, we too await the final return from exile, where we are delivered from the broken physical world, and we are restored in new, uh, new bodies where, that are resurrected and are new creations. So Advent then is the time of waiting for us as well between the first and the second comings of Jesus. We have seen him come to deal with sin, but we await him coming for the restoration of all things. So Advent is the time of not just waiting for Christmas, but it's a time of waiting for the second coming of Jesus to restore and recreate all things in the world.